it has been a while since I have done a video. I know um, a lot of been going on in, in our lives and either way. Here we are, the very last day of 2023, December 31st, 123, 123, that's the date. And we're getting ready to head into 2024. And I'm going to do my best to try to keep up with these videos because uh, God gives me a lot of words. He illuminates a lot of things. And um, he did in 2023. And I just, I either wrote them down or I was like, well, I'll do it later. And then, of course, the time never came. I allowed things to get in the way. And we're going to try not to do that in 2024 because we want more. We want more of the word of the Lord in 2024. Anyways, the reason I am doing this one today, and I'm going to kind of exit out of my screen here so that I can get to where I need to be, is I want to talk about a verse that uh, that really stuck out to me today. Um, hold on a second. Nope, that's not the version. I want to get the right version here. Um I'm going to do this in the ESV version. You have to bear with me. It's been a while since I have done these videos, so I'm just a little rusty. Um, so just forgive me for being so rusty on this, but I'm going to try to make it as real as I can. Anyways, um, I, I don't know if my volume was down too low. Oosh, can you hear me now? You know what? I'm going to pause this. No, I'm not going to pause this. If you can hear me good, then you can hear me good. Um, hopefully me turning um, turning that up helped a little bit. Anyways, in my reading today, this kind of, this scripture really stuck out at me. And and usually it's one of those, those scriptures that you just read through and keep going and you don't think twice about it. Now, one of the things that happens a lot when I'm studying or, or anything like that is he illuminates things to me that a lot of times I don't hear other people talk about or um, they have a different take. And then I, uh, you know, of course, um, I write. I don't have any of my books over here. I wonder if I can pause this and look. Um, I don't know if I could pause this or not. Yes, I can. Hold on a second. I'm going to pause this and grab one of my books. Okay, I'm back. All right, so hopefully this does it right. Oh, of course, it's going to go away. Um, this is one of my books. It's called Sackcloth and Ashes of the Heart. And it's a repentive study for the church. Very, very, very good book. If you are looking for a new study to do with your Sunday school or your small group or just yourself or your family, this is an eye-opening and amazing book to go through. It's an eight week, eight weeks long, and it has uh, daily prayer focuses, and they're all on repentance. And it's things that you would never think of repenting for. Now I know that seems like, oh, I don't, you know, everybody kind of gets a little. Well, I'm a Christian. I don't need to repent. Well, yeah, we all need to repent every day, because every day. Every minute of every day, we do something that is uh, not pleasing to God, and we need to repent for it. So this will really revive churches. It will revive people, and um, it will really bring you, give you a closer relationship with the Lord. So you can find it on Amazon.com, Sackcloth and Ashes of the Heart. And there's my name, Sherry Caruso. Um, I also have... This one right here, of course you can't see it. Oh, it went away. Anyways, it's called People of Presence, Faith and Purpose. Um, that's also on available on Amazon.com. This is a 12-week Bible study, great Bible study for women's ministries. So if you have a women's ministry, this is a great Bible study. And it basically, it's um, it helps with uh, memory, verse memorization. So you have verse memorization after every week. It's a 12 week long. And it just really kind of goes into 
um, how to increase your faith and to really delve into what your true purpose is in God's kingdom. And then I have another one. I don't have a copy here, unfortunately. Um, I ran out of them, which is good. Is uh, a children's book called Pollyanna Pickles. So all of them are available on Amazon.com. You can go and uh, find my name, Sherry, S-H-E-R-I, and Caruso, C-A-R-U-S-O. Go and look. They're, they're great, great studies. Um, also, before I forget, make sure you please like this. Please share this and um, hit the notification bar. So whenever I have another video coming out, you will be notified. But please, please, please share it. Let's raise those algorithms up. I can't even say that word. Um, can you say that word 10 times fast? Anyways. <laughs> All right. I want to get into the word that uh, I got this morning. And it's in Genesis. Genesis chapter 4. And I am going to start with, let's see. I'm going to start in verse 9. Yeah, that's where I'll start. So this is right after um, Cain had killed his brother Abel. So Genesis chapter 4, verse 9. And I'm doing this in the ESV version. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And then Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face, I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. <clears throat> then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore, en bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad. And Irad fathered Mahujal, Mahujalel, sorry, Mahujalel, and Mahujalel fathered Methushalel, and Methushalel fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of one was Adah, and the name of the other was Zillah. Adah bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in the tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who played the lyre and the pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain, and he was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And then it goes right into, back into the story of Adam and Eve. So normally I just read right through this, didn't think anything about it. It's like, okay, we're talking about, you know, Cain, we're, we're going on the story of Cain and then we're focusing right back on Adam and Eve. But we have to remember that sometimes, sometimes when we're reading the Bible, You'll, you'll be right in the mid, middle of a story, of a narrative, and then all of a sudden there will be this little piece that just doesn't seem to fit the whole narrative, and then it goes right back to the story that it was talking about. Now, there are things that we really need to pay attention to. Never take something like that and then just go, oh, okay, and skip through it and just read through it and forget it. It's there for a reason. Everything in the Bible is there for a reason. And we need to figure out why it's there. So today, this one kind of really hit me of why it's there. Now I'm going to kind of go back. So 
we were talking about how Cain killed his brother. And now we're not going to go into why he killed his brother or anything like that. But what, what I want to talk about first is he killed his brother. God caught him in the act. And then he, he didn't curse Cain. He cursed the ground. He cursed him from the ground. In other words, uh, because he was, he, Cain was the one who did, um, he did farming. So he did vegetables and things like that. So now the ground is not going to produce for him like it should. And so he's not going to be able to farm anymore because, you know, everything that he touches on the ground is not going to be fruitful. So he, and then instead of Cain repenting, Cain complained and he said, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And you've driven me away today from the ground and I'm going to be a fugitive. And, and, and now my face is hidden from you. So he knew, he knew that he was um, removed from God's grace and mercy and love um, and protection. He was, he was removed from his protection. And instead of God saying, yeah, yeah, that's what you deserve. I mean, you've done this horrible act. You've done this horrible thing. And this is your punishment, and so be it. No, what God said, no, that won't happen. You know, people aren't going to kill you. I'm going to put a mark on you. And there's a lot of debate on what that mark is, and no one knows for sure, and nobody will know for sure until we go up to heaven what that mark really was. So he put a mark on him that was very noticeable. And so that if anybody killed him, that, um, that, that the, um, the punishment for that person would be sevenfold. Um, so, and then he drew him away. Okay. So he, he leaves, he goes to another place outside of Eden. And then it says Cain knew his wife. Now I want you to kind of, you know, stop there for a minute. It says Cain knew his wife, but it doesn't say the wife's name. A lot of times when they're talking about people, when the Bible's talking about certain people or figures in the Bible, it, a lot of times it doesn't say the names of their brothers and sisters or or even their wives. But if it does, you need to pay attention. So um, so then it goes into um, Cain and, and his wife had Enoch. And then um, we're going down the generation here. So you have Enoch, then you have Irad, um, which is their grandson. Then their great-grandson, Mahuja, Mahujael. And the Mahujael, sorry if I'm butchering it, to their great great grandson Methush Methushalel, I'm thirsty, <laughs> and then to their great 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 grandson Lamech. Okay, I'm going to stop right here. So now we're into the, his great great grandson Lamech, and it says, and Lamech took two wives. So we had, first we had the first instance of. Um, the first sin, I mean, well, the first murder ever created on earth, which was King killing his brother. Now here we are. And with the first person who has um, destroyed the sanctity of a husband and wife together in marriage by gaining two wives. So that was not God's design. God's design was man and woman together. Um, his design was not for a man to have two wives or three or four or more. And his design was not to have um, wife and wife and husband and husband. His design was man and wife shall be joined together. And that's in uh, Genesis and you can find it there. That was his design. So it says he had two wives, but then it names the names of the wife, wives, wives, this doesn't happen very often when the names of the wives just all of a sudden are listed because he didn't say Cain's wives, did he? No, he talks about Lamech's wives. So we have Ada and Zillah. So I was like, hmm, I wonder what their names mean. So I went and looked and the Hebrew meaning for Ada is adornment. Okay. And then the Hebrew meaning for Zilla is shade and protection. So then it came to me that here is Lamech. He's very proud of himself, apparently. 
and because he has two wives he thinks he's all that and so what does he do he adorns himself with a beautiful wife Ada, and then he also adorns himself with another wife zilla so that he can gain protection within the shade now we know that god's protection is in the light not in the darkness nor in the shadows <clears throat> so I think of shade as in shadows. So he's just a little shady and he's a little proud of himself and he wants to adorn himself with the best of the best. So it goes on, talks about all of their children. And then he goes, Ada and Zilla, hear my voice. In other words, I am the authority in this house and you need to hear me and you need to listen to what I say. You wives of Le um, Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. So he's he's already admitting that he's done something. He's he's killed a man. He's done another murder. This is the second murder that we have seen in the Bible. And he is basically throwing his weight around, saying, I am the strong one. Don't you dare go against me. Don't you dare um, try anything with me um, because this is what I can do. If you hurt me or if you try anything, I've already killed a man. I can kill you too. Okay. I'm just paraphrasing. That's kind of what I'm thinking where he's going with this. Then he says, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77 fold. Um, hold on. I need a drink. This is where I stopped. So here's Cain, who never, never repented for what he had done. Matter of fact, he complained. He complained, everybody's going to know what I did. And you've thrown me away from your presence. You've thrown me away from the ground. The ground is cursed. I'm never going to be productive. And people are going to know it. They're going to know what I did. They're going to know that I have been ousted out. And then they're going to kill me because I'm a bad apple. And then God's like, nope, nope, that won't happen. And so he put a mark on him and, and he sent him off so that uh, people wouldn't kill him. Now, it didn't say that he was immortal. I, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, Cain was immortal and he's still alive somewhere on the earth. No, I'm sure he died of natural causes sometimes somewhere down the line. But God's grace and mercy was able to send him off and not um, judge him and strike him down for what he had done. But God had love and grace and mercy for him, hoping, hoping that he would turn around and repent for what he had done so that he could come back into the face of God. God didn't want him to leave forever. God wanted him to understand. He told him before, sin is knocking at your door. And you can't allow it to take a hold of you. And that's the lesson that God was trying to teach him. You can't allow it to take hold of you. But he did, and he ended up killing his brother. So God has grace and mercy on him and lets him live, but sends him away. He can't protect him anymore. And I think that's where a lot of people get it wrong. They think, oh, God's mad at me, and look at all these bad things that are happening to me now. But if you're not living for God, if you're not doing what God wants you to do, if you're not obeying his commandments, if you're not in his word, if you're, if you don't have a relationship with him, he can't protect you. That's kind of like you're with your parents and you leave, you voluntarily leave your parents' house. Um, they can't protect you if you're not underneath their home. So I, I guess that's kind of where I'm going with that. But that's not really what I want to focus on. Um, what I want to focus on is the fact that instead of repenting, Cain went and boasted about it. He went and told everybody, you know, because I'm sure pe whatever the mark was that he had, I'm sure people asked. And I'm sure he told them, I killed my brother. And so God kind of threw me out of the garden. I'm sure everybody knew what the garden was. 
God threw me out of the garden and, you know, here I am, but you, you can't touch me, you know, because if you touch me, if you kill me, then God's vengeance will come on you sevenfold. And so people were scared, but he boasted about it. So then what happens is Lamech comes around, the great, great, great grandson of Cain. And down the generations, he knew all about it. So he was prideful and he thought himself better than Cain. And so he thought to himself, well, if God's vengeance on him is sevenfold, then it's going to be 77 fold on me because I'm so much better than him. So this is kind of what I got out of it is just because someone does something wrong and doesn't repent of it, or it seems like the person is getting away with it, doesn't give us the right to do and turn around and do the same thing. And I think that's where our world has really gotten into a tussle and our churches as well. Um, they've allowed sin into the congregation because um, society demands them to do this or to do that and to compromise God's word. And that's what's happened. The churches have compromised God's word from pressure from the world. And I think this is kind of what it's talking about, that someone got away with something. They went and bragged about it to everybody else. And then other people are like, well, nothing happened to them. And, and look, they're doing just fine then I can do the same thing. And then it gets worse and worse and worse as it goes down the line. And people get worse and worse and worse. And society gets worse and worse and worse. Crime gets bigger. Um, people's morals are decaying. And that's what we're seeing. So God's trying to tell us that sin is knocking at the door. And we can't allow it to take hold of us. We need to repent. And we need to stay focused on God, not on men, on what other people are doing and who's getting away with what. And, oh, look, that person says they're a Christian and do, they're doing this. So then maybe I can do it too. No, you go to God's word. If God's word said it's wrong, then it's wrong. I don't care who else is doing it. I don't care how much society says it's right. I don't care if... um people call you mean and evil and, and hypocritical. God's word isn't hypocritical. God's word isn't love, mean. It's love. We have to understand that, that God's word doesn't tell us what we want to hear. God's word tells us what we need to hear. And sometimes what we need to hear is not what we want to hear. But the prize is so much bigger and so much better to have an everlasting life in heaven with God forever and ever and ever. Why would you swindle that away? Why would you squander that? Why would you throw that in the trash just because Johnny Joe over there is doing this and he's gotten away with it so maybe I should do it. Or Susie Sue over there is, you know, she's not going to church every day and she's not reading her Bible. And she says she's a Christian, you know, although, you know, sometimes her, her language doesn't really show that she's a Christian, but she says she is. So I can do the same thing and I'll be okay because I'm a good person deep down inside. I'm a good person. Hmm. God's word says, no one is good. Not one is good. When the fall of mankind happened, our hearts are evil from the very beginning. When a child has a temper tantrum, it's not that they've learned it from their, their parents. It's something inside of our DNA. It's something, um, it's that resistance. It's that, that, um, I can't even think of the word, <laughs> but it's just in our nature. It's who, who we are, which the whole Bible is trying to show us from beginning from to the end, from Genesis to Revelation, that we can't do it on our own. We can't save ourselves. We can't work our way into heaven by doing good things. 
That's not how it works. We need to rely on him. He's done the final sacrifice. Jesus has done the final sacrifice on the cross. He shed his blood. He died and he rose again and he went up to heaven and he has paid the price for my sin, for your sin, for the murderer, to anybody else that you can think of any other crime that is worse than murder. He did it because he loved you. He loved me. He has loved everybody in the world from the beginning of time to the end of time. It doesn't matter what you've done. His grace and his mercy is still available. It's available for all. All you have to do is ask for it. All you have to do is have remorse and repent and ask God to be your Lord and Savior and then follow him. Do the things that he asks you to do, not the things that the world tells you to do. I think that's kind of what we need to learn from this. And what we need to take into 2024. Why not make a change? It's a new year. Why not have more in 2024? More of God. More love. More joy. More happiness. More success. Just more. More of the good things. God's words tells us that, that he's known us before we were born. His thoughts were on us before we were even a twinkling in our parents' eyes. And he has plans for us, plans for us to prosper, plans for good things for us, not bad things. He doesn't want that. Yes, it rains on the just and the unjust. I mean, bad things happen because we live in a fallen world. That's just how it is. And we can't make sense out of a lot of things that have happened in your life or other people's lives. Some things just don't make sense. And there's no way you're going to be able to understand it because God's ways are greater than ours. And we can't understand some of the things that he does and says. So why not make a change? in 2024. Ask God to be your Lord. Ask God to be your Savior. Get on the right track from day one. And may the Lord bless you. So, Happy New Year. <laughs>